This episode of Mike Plays RP1 will see me going higher, further, and faster than ever before in the third iteration of my V2 rocket. During the build, I will be exploring a little deeper into the modular launch pads mod, and I'll finally dive into using McJeb's ascent guidance to control the rocket. Don't worry, Kerbal operating system isn't going anywhere. Indeed, I'll be looking at how KOS and McJeb can be used together to give you even more control over automating your missions. Along the way, there will be seven additional missions featuring the X2 rocket plane and various configurations of my AeroB sounding rockets. Let's get started. A quick reminder that I am still in a deficit situation, continually losing money as time goes on. This is a result of moving from version 2 to version 3 of RP1, which saw a change in the budgeting model. This resulted in my current program budget temporarily being cut to zero. I'm going to need to keep a close eye on finances for the next bit. If things get tight, I may have to fire my program administrator, Milton Rosin, as he comes with a 20% penalty to my budget. I'll then replace him with a more conservative leader. The two candidates I'm considering are Valentin Klushko, who will knock back research salaries by 15%, and Sergei Korolev, who knocks everyone's salaries back by 12%, but comes with a 5% program funding penalty. In the meantime, I'm just noticing that I'm eight engineers short in Launch Complex 2. LC2 is responsible for the V2 rockets. The extra spots are a result of a recent expansion to the complex. This happens each time you up the mass limit. I currently have 20 applicants available, so there is no cost for hiring, but, of course, their salaries will still add to the budget. I decided to hire anyway to help pump out new rockets more quickly. Speaking of which, it's time to improve upon the V2. V2 number 2 flew last episode, taking photographs of the Earth's surface from near space. But thanks again to the switch to RP1 version 3, the contract spawned again, now requiring a higher altitude and greater downrange distance. For this, I'm going to need a bigger rocket. I do have available the upgrade from the current A4 engine to the significantly more powerful A9, but there is a 40,000 funds purchase price for the upgrade, a price I was reluctant to pay given my current financial situation. I did, however, upgrade the steel tank to aluminum and increase the length to 10.1 meters, bringing the engine burn time to its maximum of 70 seconds. In hindsight, I should have been maximizing the engine burn time back with the first iteration of this rocket. It likely would have saved me some tooling costs. I also decided to finally start exploring using McJeb for the ascent and discovered it wasn't nearly as difficult to understand as it first appeared. In fact, I found McJeb, in conjunction with Kerbal Operating System, was a pretty powerful duo. I will speak more to that when I launch this vehicle later in this episode. As well, I decided to dress up the launch pad a bit by looking more deeply into the parts provided by Alpha Mensa's modular launch pads. There are a ton of parts here to customize your launches, but I went with a trio of small radial launch clamps, a TT06-A launch stability enhancer, all atop an MLP general mounting platform. I did have some issues with the platform not releasing the rocket, but it turned out the problem was simply that I didn't have the rocket's avionics package as the root part. Once that was changed, platform performed exactly as I would have wanted. This 14-ton rocket did require another launch complex upgrade, an upgrade that will take two weeks to complete, but will allow me to assign 11 more engineers to the integration team. As mentioned, you'll be seeing all of this soon enough, but right now, it's time to get started with some other missions, beginning with the XASR-2 sounding rocket. This rocket was last seen two episodes ago, taking a small biological sample and 35 units of sounding payload to an altitude of over 100 kilometers. 
This contract requires me to take 75 units of sounding payload to an altitude of 80 kilometers. This optional contract doesn't disappear once it's completed. Instead, the reward resets to zero and then begins building up again over time. Right now, the contract gets me 36 reputation, which, if you recall, does increase the subsidy that I receive. I need all the money that I can get. I still have the biological payload aboard, which needs to be recovered in order to collect the science, even though that isn't a requirement of the contract. And that recovery went without any issues, netting us another 2.9 science, but we've got a lot of missions to get through today. Next up is Kenneth Taylor piloting the X-2 rocket plane. I hope people don't mind me just punching through these so quickly, but they are so similar, if not identical, to missions I've flown in the past. In fact, this mission is exactly the same as two missions flown last episode, collecting more of the supersonic flight science, which requires us to cruise at a speed between 450 and 500 meters per second. Though I did make one small change to this plane. In those previous flights, the plane had a tendency to nose down when the drag chute was fully deployed. I think that the problem was that the parachute was well below the center of mass of the plane. So before this flight, I simply moved the parachute up higher in the hangar. So let's see what difference the change makes. Parachutes. Now I'm just dropping. Oh my god, that was beautiful! Brakes on. <laughs> so it's coming a little bit out of one of those nozzles, but you know what, I'm just going to live with that. Soon after this, the expansion of Launch Complex 2 was complete, and after transferring 11 engineers from the hangar to LC2, the integration of V2 number 3 began. But even with the smaller team, it didn't take long for the hangar to turn around the X2 so that Evelyn Wolf could have a turn. Evelyn has the exact same mission as Kenneth, collecting supersonic flight science, but she first needs to get to her cruising altitude of 20 kilometers. I've got one new thing to show you with the Waypoint Manager mod. If we get rid of these useless auto-generated ones, I now have the actual runway to aim for. In all my other flights, I've been selecting the launch pad from map view, but after Kenneth's previous landing, I simply created a waypoint at his current location, called it Runway, and saved it, making it available for all subsequent missions. It's well overdue to have something I can aim directly at. Okay, and altitude now is 300. Down we go. This is done. How much science? 1.4 science, so we're now at 6.1 out of 9.9. .9. That leaves 3.8 science left and at 1.4 science per mission this should take three more flights to complete. But in the meantime Launch Complex 1 has rolled out another XASR-2. Okay so this is purely science. So we'll open up all our science stuffy. So there we are. And we'll run. I have no idea how high this will go. Run XASR1 and go. I have no idea how high this will go. I never tested it. Okay, all I did was remove the sounding payload off the previous launch and just pushed it right back in again. So um, this will go higher, you know, all things going well, but how much higher? I have no idea. We're going to find out. This is likely the last launch in the XASR series as I have the early rocketry tech node unlocking in just a few weeks, which will allow me to upgrade this engine. And I already have a contract in mind for the upgraded rocket. 140, 50, oh, just shy of 160. Cannot complain. Okay, we are now again exposing our fruit flies to more... But I'm pretty sure once I'm over 140, I should be getting some more. I think the telemetry is done, but we should be getting, um, I think, pressure and temperature scans, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, 840. There we go. So what do we got? We got pressure scan. Yeah, pressure scan and the uh, 
temper scan, and then a different biological sample. We hardly got any of this science before. There's lots of space biologicals, near space biological samples, and temperature scan. Okay. Are we getting another? Oh, I do not think it's staged because that was time warp. So we'll have to do that manually. This mission ended up delivering 6.6 .6 more science to feed the researchers in the R&D center. And then it was more science, this time with Kenneth, once again in the X-2 rocket plane, who added on another 1.4 supersonic flight science, which is now at 7.5 science of the available 9.9. .9. Or is it? Because the post-recovery report had something else to say. Okay, uh... Wait, whoa, what? I'm done? This says 9.9 .9 of 9... That's... is... what? <laughs> what? Huh? What? Okay, wait, wait, wait. Let's look at that. Um, it's a supersonic flight. It says it's all in the R&D set. Okay, um, I've got it. Oh, and it says 80% complete. How the heck does... How does it work here that there's nothing left to get? I'm gonna fly one more because I'm confused. Here it says 80% complete. Yet, it says that there's no value here. So, I am very much confused. Well, the resolution of this mystery is going to have to wait until Evelyn can get back up there and investigate. In the meantime, early rocketry was unlocked, allowing me to upgrade the Araby engine to its final iteration, the AJ-10-27, which provides a higher thrust, slightly lower ISP, but 12 additional seconds of burn time. The contract I have in mind is low space biological experimentation, which requires me to bring the biological sample capsule and 75 units of sounding payload to an altitude of 120 kilometers and safely return. Once again, I just increased the length of the fuel tank to maximize burn time, hitting a whopping 8.6 meters. I had already tooled a service module for the 75 units of sounding payload for the first XASR-2 mission you saw earlier in this video, so it was easy to look in the RP-1 tooling menu and see what dimensions I needed to make another one. This rocket finally cracked the 1 ton mass limit for Launch Complex 1, forcing its first major renovation. The renovation will take 23 days, but will allow me to transfer over 7 more engineers from the hangar providing a boost that actually got this rocket integrated and rolled out a day before the V2. As such, you will be seeing its inaugural launch a little later in this video, but not before Evelyn Wolf has had a chance to investigate what's going on with the supersonic flight science. Okay, we just cracked 450 meters per second, and yeah, it says 9.9 .9 science out of 9.9, .9, and it isn't collecting anymore. So this flight is pretty much useless, might as well get her home. Back in the hangar I noticed that early rocketry has got me two upgrades to the engine on the X2, one for 5,000 funds which provides a marginal performance improvement and one for 13,000 funds which has considerably less burn time but significantly more thrust. The latter of these two is clearly meant to be a record breaker but again 13,000 funds is a little rich for my blood right now. I did test the cheaper upgrade to see how well it could collect the higher speed Mach 2 flight science, but found it only collected half a science point in a single flight. I could likely increase the size of the plane so it could carry more fuel, but I'm not convinced it's worth my time. Early rocketry not only got me those engine upgrades, but also the mighty RD-200 and NAA-75-110A series engines. I mean, look at these. They are Soviet and American 50s era ICBM engines, but they cost 25,000 and 40,000 funds each respectively. Not being able to afford these engines and upgrades is killing me, so I took some steps to speed up the road to getting my finances into the black. First, I removed Milton Rosin as program administrator and replaced him with Valentin Klushko. The firing cost me 15.9 reputation, but removes Milton's 20% funding penalty and reduces research staff salaries by 15%. But the measures didn't end there. I also decided to shut down the hangar, firing the remaining seven engineers that were not pilfered by the two launch complexes, however I kept on my two astronauts. 
I'm hoping it won't be too long until I can afford to get the hangar up and running again. This left the path clear for the two launch complexes to integrate and roll out their rockets with, as mentioned, Launch Complex 1 just winning the race with the spanking new AJ-10-27. But perhaps there is a price to pay for the bad morale that layoffs and salary cuts inevitably create. Oh, we have a launch failure. Shoot. To be honest, it's just as well because I had forgotten to put the 75 units of sounding payload into the service module. As such, this contract wouldn't have completed anyway. Obviously, I'm going to push out another one of these, this time making sure the sounding payload is aboard, but that is going to have to be for next episode because right now it's time to jump to early Halloween morning for the main event of this video, the launch of V2 number 3. What we're going to do with this launch is actually use McJeb, but we're going to use McJeb in combination with KOS. So right off the bat here, I modified the boot file by just adding a few print statements um, right here. And it says what the McJeb settings are to get the ascent profile that I want. Uh, that was a very simple thing to do. It's just a few print settings because the thing is, is between my testing of this thing and my launching today, I'm very likely to forget these numbers and by putting them into the boot file it comes up right off the bat and we can take a look at it. So let's take a look at McJeb and we'll talk a little bit about McJeb and I'll also talk a little bit about this program. There are a few things in there but it's not, it's actually a much simpler program than the previous V2. So we'll open up McJeb here. What we're interested in is the Ascent Guidance System. So we're going to turn that on and so this is McJeb's Ascent, let's open this window up. So let's take a look at the orbital settings that I got here. So there are some things to adjust. And in fact, I'm also going to put in the edit the ascent path and bring that little window up. So the first thing to adjust is your actual orbital altitude. So I have this set at 250 because that worked out really well. Now you got to remember that this ascent guidance is designed to put you into orbit. So what it's going to do is it's going to ascend until your apoapsis get to, gets to whatever altitude you set here and then it's going to cut the throttle and then attempt to circularize at that altitude. That's not what's going to happen with this rocket. This rocket has only one ignition on the engine. If it cuts the throttle, it's done. So you need to make sure that this altitude is above the altitude that it will reach before it runs out of fuel. Remember, we want this to run until it is dry. We are searching for a minimum altitude of 220 kilometers. Um, 250 I found in testing worked really well, so uh, that's what it's set at, but it's not going to get in orbit at that, and that's just what it's going to be. The default inclination, again, this is really set up for um, stock games where the KSC is conveniently placed on the equator, and so the default inclination is actually zero, but the problem is that the uh, Cape Canaveral here is at a latitude of 28.54 degrees north and you cannot launch into an inclination that's lower than your current altitude. I'll leave it to you to justify that to yourself, but that's just a fact. So I cannot launch into a zero inclination altitude. So they give you this nice current button. So if you press that, it just puts in your current latitude and it goes, oh, okay, you want to go for that inclination. We're going to go due east and that's going to put us into an inclination of 28.5 degrees if I were to go into orbit. But you want to set up those two things as well. And that's what I got over here. Um, the other things you can actually ended up leaving these on the default, but I will show them to you. So for instance, final flight path angle. Um, I, the default is for that to be at zero because when you get up to the top of your flight path, you want to be going horizontal, but you can change that to be whatever you want. I, you can change it to 75 so that at the end of your flight path, when you get to 250 kilometers, uh, you're going to be at 75 degrees or you can set it at 45 degrees or whatever you like it to be. The other thing you can do is change the tr shape. If you put it at 0%, it's a straight line. It goes up, it goes to a certain altitude, it starts its uh, pitching maneuver and here it's just going to go straight line at 45 degrees 
or you can put it at 100 percent i'm not exactly sure how the percent works or you can put it at anywhere in between and you can play around with that and find out what's the most efficient it will change for each rocket i honestly did not play around with it too much because i found if i put this at 50 and i put this at zero that I hit the parameters that I needed to go. So I will play around with this more as we go on further than that. But uh, this is enough for me to get this rocket to do what I want. And it's gonna go, it's gonna run out of fuel long before it completes this flight path. It'll run out of fuel around here somewhere, but by then it's all gonna be fine. A um, Couple of other things you do want to, if I go into options right now, this is, by the way, these two buttons at the top, that's for target and that's just for your target orbit. You can put in parameters for that. If you want to hide it, you can do that. But also these are options, uh, various all kinds of options. I'm not going to worry about them too much here. I left them all on the default except auto stage. You want auto stage to be off because what auto stage does, let me actually turn it off is when the engine flames out due to lack of fuel it's going to assume you want and it's not reached its target yet it's going to assume you are wanting to stage to put on the next stage right that you're going on to your next stage of your ascent vehicle uh that's what it would think because it thinks you're going into orbit but when this engine runs out it actually if it stages again it's going to deploy the payload at the top which i don't want it to do so i'm going to turn off the auto staging all the staging is going to be handled by KOS. Okay, so we're going to turn that off. We're going to actually turn off this ascent guy, and we're just going to tuck this over to here, put in the parameters that we need according to this. Now, what I also want to show you is really quickly um, my program. So it is called V2 number three, not surprisingly. And it's much simpler. I'm just going to hit the highlights because there's not that much that's new that you have not seen uh, last episode when I went through that. Uh, just a couple of parameters here. Desired heading is 90 degrees. Deploy altitude is the same as last time. It's going to be 80 kilometers and that's going to be 80 kilometers on the way down. A lot of this is structured in the same, but what I've taken out is the whole pitching maneuver and gravity turn stuff because that's what McJeb's gonna take care of. But what we're gonna take care of is a couple of other things. So number one is, once we're done the countdown, and once, uh, and by the way, there's one small change I made in the countdown thing, and that is I took out the lock throttle to one, because McJeb's gonna take care of the throttle, but I did put in a lock steering to up, like I did in my previous program, because I found that McJeb didn't handle coming off the launch pad that great. I, I don't know what that is. So we're just gonna lock the steering to up, and then after two seconds, after it's done the launch, we're going to unlock the steering, at which point McJeb will be taking over, and that happens automatically, and I even put a little print statement, passing attitude control to McJeb. That's the only difference in the countdown one. Uh, then we have a lock to prograde one. I want it to lock to prograde after the engine flames out. So let's take a look at that. So if we take a look at lock to prograde down here towards the bottom, uh, what it's going to do, again, a little function here. Um, so basically, once the countdown is done, it's gonna get into this function and it's going to wait until, and I got a little bit of a formula here, so I wanna explain the formula. I'm just gonna widen this a bit. So the whole formula is all in one line. Right here, this formula here. So. We're going to wait until, okay, ship, which is this ship, find the available thrust, and then what goes in the brackets are your current thrust heading, uh, thrust setting, which is a number between zero and one. I got in there one, 1. 1.0. So basically it's saying, what's the thrust that the rocket has available if you have the throttle at full? And on this side, I have the mass, which is the mass of the rocket. It's the current mass of the rocket. It'll just take that number, multiplying it by a constant. The constant is G naught. G naught's that little G you see in so many formulas. It's the acceleration due to gravity. It's that very familiar 9.8 meters per second squared. Mass times G naught is the weight of the rocket. So basically, if 
the thrust of the rocket at full thrust is less than the weight of the rocket that means your thrust to weight ratio is less than one and your rocket ain't gonna go up no more or at least it's not gonna be accelerating in an upward direction but the only situation in which this is going to occur is if the engine stops working once the engine's going we got a thrust to weight ratio greater than one so this is my little cue to say this is when the engine has flamed out so once that's happened once our thrust is dropped below the weight of the rocket it's going to lock it to the surface prograde vector which you have seen this is the same the rest of this locked program is the same locked prograde as before and the deploy payload which would be the next step after that it's going to wait until the altitude is less than that deployment altitude which was declared at the top 80,000 meters or 80 kilometers and the vertical speed of the rocket is a negative number it's less than zero so basically when we hit 80 kilometers on our way down both of those two conditions have to be true we're going to do the deploy the payload stuff which is just a staging command really right there oh there it is stage okay and then it'll stage the payload. that's the same as it worked before so that is really the whole program it's simpler than before because mcjeb is going to handle everything for us so i'm just going to actually exit this we're going to open this up here and we got a little bit of instructions engage the autopilot so engage autopilot just to remind me to do that i did by the way just to make sure i have auto stage off i do oh oh i hid the nav ball show ascent nav ball guidance i wonder what that is okay anyway off and we're going to uh run our program run v2 number three and the familiar program and what's really nice is what happens with all these launch clamps here we're waiting for the engine to spool up and everything blows away a little bit of a wiggle again i don't know whatever it's off it's off and now it's past the attitude over to mcjeb and mcjeb is now going to steer the rocket there it goes starting to knock it over towards the towards the east as it is wont to do oh contracts let's take a look at our Recall the contract is again to take the film camera into space, same as last episode, except this time I must reach an altitude of 200 kilometers and a downrange distance of 600 kilometers. We'll at least know whether we'll meet the minimum altitude part of this once we flame out. And we should have, yep, well over our target altitude of 220. It is, believe it or not, locked the prograde, but our air is so thin up here. I mean, it's trying. I can put it here. You see how the yaw is way over here? It's trying. It really is, but uh, it ain't. It, it can't hold the attitude of the rocket anymore. That's okay. We can tumble a little bit. But either way, we're collecting our science here, planetary photography. So we're going to get up to a 227. So we can time warp that part. Doing a little tumbling. I got to say, this is a really nice feature of... I guess it's realism overhaul is doing this, but when you time warp, it doesn't freeze the attitude of the rocket. It's still tumbling the way it was before, and I really like that. Now, there is a mod called Persistent Rotation. It's not installed, so it's not that mod that's doing it. I believe it's realism overhaul itself that's doing it, um, but I really like it, and I often do install Persistent Rotation because I do like this so much in my other games, but the problem that I've had bugs with Persistent Rotation that have bitten me in the past so um I, i'm a little gun shy about it so i'm really happy that realism overhaul takes care of this for me okay so once we drop below 140 kilometers our sciencing is going to stop i can see there's still about two minutes and 30 seconds worth of photography to do there we go we're now that so that is now done if i look at my data we've got how much science did we this is all in it doesn't give you how much science it just gives you the weight of everything oh here this one i guess there's not enough science here to be worth our while but i did get 2.6 science in earth space low over the water okay that's biome specific too good to know good to know good to know so that is that all done the next step is the separation of the payload okay and we have reached our downrange distance and then somewhere else 720 kilometers just about oh just over that 
And with that, our contract was pretty much complete. All that was left to do was to wait for the parachutes to deploy and recover after splashdown. Remember, I've yet to optimize the ascent of this rocket. It's entirely possible it is capable of traveling even further downrange than this. As well, I gotta take another crack at the AJ-10-27 sounding rocket and also hope that my finances normalize pretty soon. But all that is going to have to wait for future episodes. In the meantime, I thank you for watching and hope to see you again next time.